Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Mark. So today we're pleased to hear from Ron Patterson. He is an extension agent and professor for Morgan and Weber counties. And he just recently moved from Carbon County. So he used to be an extension agent there. Um, his specialties are 4-H, agriculture, natural resources, and horticulture. And you might recognize him if you've ever visited the USU Extension YouTube channel. He's pretty popular. He's got a lot of videos there. Um, a lot. He has a whole playlist of videos on Gardening 101, and he has one of the most popular videos on that YouTube channel with over 200,000 views. So he's YouTube famous, and um, he's helped write several fact sheets and He's going to talk to us today about pruning and trellising tomatoes. So we'll turn the time over to him. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. Um, I'm going to share the results. Ron, let me know if you can see these. And if not, I'll sort of read them off to you. Can you see, Ron, can you see the results? Yeah, I, I can okay. see those, yes. Good. If you just want to, we'll take a second now. I'm sharing those with attendees so you can see those too. So it looks like uh, most uh, for the grower types, mostly back backyard growers we've got people that are doing um both uh, vegetables and, and fruit was the highest number there and then uh zero to ten acres it, it looks like for the number of acres folks are growing on cool cool are we ready for me now yeah you can go ahead and share your screen okay and Ron, sorry yes. do you want me to let you know when questions come in or are you gonna stop half I've, I've got stops I've got two or three stops there in the middle so we'll, okay. we'll stop and take questions perfect thank you all right share screen if, if I'm not too technologically inept here we should be able to do this right yeah it looks good to, so far okay so let me get you back to the first uh, screen and start what we're doing now it was interesting to see where everybody's coming from I first learned this uh, pruning technique when I was back in North Carolina so some of you folks back east uh, you're, you're the breeding ground for for what I learned and then I uh, I've used it a lot in my own production and and share it with other people Utah is not necessarily the tomato growing capital of the world but uh, when it comes to saving space we we're, we're actually Utah is the second most urban state in the country and because of that we have a lot of people crowded along the Wasatch Front and then the small population small part of the population is, is out in in the rural counties and so we have uh, crowded space uh, small small yards and things like that people still want to grow tomatoes and so that's one of the reasons I felt this was important to, to cover for my state so we'll be covering uh, pruning and trellising tomatoes today. Hopefully that's the one you wanted to sign up for because that's where we are. Let's see, I need to move your picture, Mark, because that's taking you away. There we go. All right, so the objective is what I'd like to cover today is, is I want to, um, this will be pretty basic for, for some people and, and hopefully not too boring, but we'll quickly go through the anatomy of the tomato plant and uh, tomato growth types, different types of support systems, the actual pruning of tomatoes, and then the supporting uh, that we go through. And then at the very end, Cammy is forcing me to talk about pest control a little bit, so we'll kind of talk about, about how this actually will help in our pest control activities. So that, that's the objectives of what I'd like to cover today. So a tomato plant, what, uh, what are we talking about here? Well, there are different parts that we need to, to discuss. The leaf on a tomato plant is actually very large. That is one leaf right there. It is uh, what we call either pinnately or bipinnately compound. Uh, so the little parts here, I guess, does my arrow show up when I do that, Mark? Yes. Okay. So the, the, this is called a leaflet. And this whole thing is called the leaf. And so when we start talking about the leaf and the leaf axle and the node, and we'll cover some more of these uh, terms here. The node is, is that spot right there on the stem. It's a stem term, so it's referring to that point of attachment where that leaf attaches to the stem. So right here, when we say node, that's what we're talking about. 
and then the leaf axle is you almost think this is the same thing that we're talking about here but but it's a little bit different it is in the same location but it's that angle right there between the stem and the leaf so when we talk about the leaf axle and a, a bud it, that comes up between that uh, at the leaf axle that's what we're talking about bud that comes up right there in that point of the, uh, the plant and so then that's what's called an axillary bud in tomatoes we call the axillary bud a sucker and so when we talk about suckers that's what we do so now that another point key point here we're talking about is flower clusters you see there we have flower clusters we've got uh, this is the first flower cluster and here's the second flower cluster up here and about every three leaves sometimes it's four occasionally it's two but out of every three leaf along the stem you'll get another flower cluster sometimes these flower clusters will they'll be four or five or uh, six or seven uh, flowers on those clusters but sometimes also with different varieties especially cherry tomatoes they almost seem like they're they're indeterminate they just keep producing more and more and more flowers and so that's uh, something else that we'll talk a little bit about when we when we cover the pruning part okay <clears throat> Now we're talking about suckers right there. The suckers, you'll have a sucker at almost every leaf axle will produce a sucker. That's uh, right here. The sucker this is this part of the plant. Here's the leaf, here's the stem, and you've got that bud growing. So that's what we call a sucker. Um, and the suckers that are closest to the flower, you have the flower. Cluster right here. Branches, for all intents and purposes, I treat these branches as though they're suckers. This, if you notice here, how they come out of the stem, the sucker is attached a little bit differently. It's more almost like the branch is a conjoined twin, if you will. It, it comes up here and it just branches. So this one it has the flower clusters in the main stem. This is a secondary stem, a branch but I treat that as a sucker when I do my pruning. So, so the branches are nearly equal in strength. You see the sucker here is not nearly as strong as what these two branches will be. And then the secondary, the secondary stem or branch, it's flower, it'll flower up here a little further up the stem, this primary stem. And so that's how you tell which one is the main stem or primary stem and which one is the secondary branch is your flower cluster is going to be there first on the main stem. It'll be further up the stem on the branch. So that's a little bit about the suckers and the branches. Okay, so the stems then, um, they're just basically the support structure of the plant on tomatoes, a herbaceous vine, or uh, in the case of uh, determinate tomatoes, a shrub. They are not strong enough to keep the fruit off the ground, and that's why we support and trellis them, because as your fruit gets ripen, uh, uh, ripening, uh, you get insects that will cause problems with the uh, uh, fruit as it touches the ground and gets more ripe. So when I was a kid, my dad used to put uh, tires around his tomatoes to help support them and keep them up off the ground and also depending on how you do it, it helps to warm the soil a little bit. Uh, most of us have seen the tomato cages, the commercial cages, uh, and I will probably talk a little bit about those. And then, uh, depending on the type of tomato you got, a trellis may be a better option for you. So uh, the stems need support in order to keep the fruit off the ground. It actually makes it a lot easier to harvest too. You don't have to be bending over so bad, so much. Okay, so at this point then, if there are any questions that come in, have come in, and, and Mark, you can do that number one poll that, uh, that I set for you. Okay, and then we'll we're, answer we're, questions. Okay, now we're, we're going to ask about whether they, they've pruned before? Yes. Okay, so I'm launching that poll now, folks. Do we have any questions in the Q&A? There are no questions yet. 
cool. Either I've explained things really well or <laughs> I've done very poorly. So <laughs> hey, I think we'll you've done well. We'll take another 10 seconds, folks, for the poll. Alrighty, and I'm going to share those results now. Can you see those, uh, Ron? Not yet. No. When you're sharing a screen, sometimes it's kind of odd, and you may not uh, – may have sort of be off to the side. And if you don't, I I'll just sort of read it off to you. So, yeah, yes, just, we, yeah, we have 58% that say yes, they have pruned before, uh, and 42% no. So it's about, about cool. half and half. Cool. Well, we've got some experience, and then we've got some – that's great. All right. So we'll move on. We do and, have a few questions that came in, too. Okay. Um, so someone asked, I've heard you can lightly prune determinate plants. Is that true? I will cover the, the pruning in here a little bit later. So, yes, I will cover that uh, determinate plant pruning. Okay. And then – Yes, it's, yes, it's true. <laughs> okay. Um, can we plant tomatoes now and how to keep them alive in cold weather? Yeah, so I plant about mid-April to get too big in, in our climate here. And so uh, what I – wall of water or uh, even if you just – I use milk jugs with water. I put water in milk jugs. I put the milk jugs out by the plant. And since I drink, drink a lot of milk and so I uh, have milk jugs, I save them all winter long. But I put a milk jug by the plant and then I'll put a row cover or something over the top of that, that during the day, the water will collect energy. And during the night, it gives off energy. And then that row cover helps to keep the heat in there. And so as long as it doesn't get, I've kept plants uh, alive that way down into the mid 20s. So uh, that's, that's an option. But yes, um, Typically, I try to not go more than five at the most six weeks before my um, actual. You got the average last frost date, and then you got what the local gardeners say. Yeah, I don't plant my tomatoes before a particular day because I know it's going to freeze. Um, so that's I, I try to stay about six weeks before that date. Um, and so yeah, uh, they need to be protected. Just some sort of a row cover with a heat sink to to help keep the heat in there. Okay. Um, someone asked, what happens if you cut the stem versus a sucker? I think I pruned incorrectly. You can, the sucker can kind of take over for the stem. So uh, if, if you happen to do, and I've done that in the past too. Oops, that was the wrong one. Dang. So, so you just take, hopefully you didn't prune off all the suckers before you got up to that. And so you don't have anything going. But uh, if you've got a sucker that's growing, just go ahead and take that one and, and uh, trellis it up so that it is, it'll be a little slower. The next fruit producing will be behind if you kept the main stem, but it will continue to produce. Okay. And then one more. Someone asked to, if you could explain again the difference between the stem and the sucker. Okay. The, the main... I think I'll, I think I'll that we'll probably cover that pretty well when I do the pruning part here. Um, so let's let's move on. I believe that if that doesn't get covered, scream at me again, and we'll we'll make sure we get that that question answered. Okay, okay moving on. Then we've got basically two growth types of tomatoes. Now, some people throw in a third one, but they really shouldn't or they don't need to. We talk about this determinate, and then some people say a semi-determinate. Really what they mean when they say semi-determinate it is it's a little bit taller, but it's still a determinate tomato. Uh, and so we'll cover a little bit on what that means. And then there's the indeterminate tomato, and so we'll cover that. Typically what I want to point out on this slide is your catalogs and seed packets will usually say whether or not they're a determinant, well, whether they're determinant or indeterminate. They'll usually say that. Now, not always, but, but usually you can see that on the package or in the seed count. If you go to the nursery and you pick up plants, the tags don't typically say that. And so sometimes they do, 
And so just be aware, am I getting a determinate or an indeterminate because that will affect how you prune and how you support that plant. If, if it's not on the tag, most of these nurseries should have that information somewhere, and so you need to ask them, is this a determinant or indeterminate? Now, if it's a variety that you grow all the time, you would know that answer, but if it's a new variety that you want to try out, get that answer so that you, you put in the right type of support system. You don't. They just keep growing and growing, and it's not designed to support that kind of a tomato. So, so get that answer. So let's Ron, talk let a little bit in. about the determinate tomato. Yeah, yeah, sure. Ron, let me hop in for a second. If you don't mind, why don't you mute your video? You've you're for the most part you're clear, but we we've lost you for a few few seconds a couple of times. So in the lower left hand corner, you'll have a stop video button. Go ahead and click that. That that'll help save just a little little bit of band bandwidth. Stop video button. Yeah, now nah, and we'll we'll still be able to see your 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 screen, but it'll it'll stop the actual video feed as far as showing your your face goes. So it's 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 going to be inside the Zoom window in the lower left hand corner. There's a mute button and there's a stop video button. And I'm sorry, oh. it's going to be up top. Yeah, it's going to okay. be there. You go. All right, that's it. Yep, good, good to go. Uh, this probably has something to do with my poor. Blame it on my connection, you know, rural, I'm not even rural Utah, but I've got a really bad connection in my office, so that's the way it goes. Okay, thank you, Mark. So determinant and semi-determinant, what determinant means is the stem grows until at some point, the end of the stem, the end of that main stem, it stops in a flower. There's no more vegetative growth going on beyond that flower. And so if you look at this particular picture, I get back to where I'm. Uh, okay, there we go. So it ends in that terminal flower, which is that right there on this this photo. You'll see that there's a sucker growing right here, and I've tried to get those suckers on determinate tomatoes to grow and produce, and that's been extremely difficult. When you get to this terminal bud, and all that's there is just flower buds, you get to that point. That's a determinant. Whether it's semi-determinate or determinate, it's the same thing. Determinate, usually they, it's a small plant like the little patio plants and things like that. It's just the same thing. It's, what it means is it's terminated in a flower. So uh, that's how you would tell when you get up there. And sometimes even you'll have indeterminate tomatoes that will come up and all of a sudden you get a terminal flower bud and there is no more vegetative bud going on. In that case, it's become a determinant. At least that particular stem has become determinant, and usually the other stem will keep going. So anyway, uh, determinate uh, tomatoes are typically four feet tall or less. You might get them up to five feet, but not usually. Uh, they have a tight harvest schedule. One of the advantages to determinate tomatoes is that that they tend to produce most of their fruit in a very tight harvesting window. And so the commercial growers like determinate tomatoes out in the field and get their equipment out there, get the harvesting done, get off the field kind of a thing. The greenhouse uh, growers, a little bit different situation, but out in the field, that's the way that goes. There's uh, the suckers. Again, this is, this is a sucker. It's, you can kind of tell by the way it's attached right there to the stem, but you've got a main stem and you can see this sucker over here on this side, main stem. and it, It keeps going up here, uh, cluster. And we can prune lightly, back to that question that we had earlier. We, with determinate tomatoes, we support them with a cage or there's a, what's called a Florida weave system that's actually quite handy uh, and maybe a little bit faster even than putting it cages in, maybe even a little bit stronger support system. <clears throat> now the indeterminate tomato, it's non-terminal. So here you've got, this is the main stem, and it's going up to kind of answer that other question. We have the main stem going up here, and there at the leaf axle, you have a sucker growing out at the leaf axle. So hopefully that helps you to see that difference between where you have the main stem and the sucker. 
Um, again, it's non-terminal. In other words, it continues to grow. So here we have a flower, flower cluster right here. We've got another flower cluster right here. And beyond this flower cluster, we have more vegetative growth going. So that's a non-terminal um, growth that you would see on the indeterminate tomatoes. And a, a determinate tomato will look like that until at some point it ends in a flower, a flower cluster. You don't get this vegetative extension right there. All right, the length of the, the length of harvesting is dependent on the length of season, your growing season. So um, when I get my tomatoes in in mid-April and I can grow them until my first frost in the fall, or maybe a little bit beyond if I can keep them protected, but uh, I can harvest from mid-June until October, and I would get a harvest throughout that whole season. And so that's one of the advantages then of an indeterminate tomato is you've got a harvest you can supply for your table or for your customers or whatever the case may be. You supply the tomatoes for the whole growing season instead of a tight cluster kind of a thing. So it just depends on, on your focus. If you're going to be doing paste tomatoes or doing tomato sauce or whatever, you'll want determinate. And that's one of the reasons why most of your Roma tomatoes, Roma type tomatoes are are determinate because people want a whole big bunch of those to do it at the same time. If you're going to be doing bacon tomato sandwiches, well, I don't want a whole bunch of tomatoes to be doing bacon and tomato sandwiches at one time. I want it over the whole season. So, um, so those are the advantages then to the indeterminate tomatoes. You've got that extended harvest. Again, you get suckers at every leaf axle. You get this sector here, and with this you you can kind of see. A little bit there's a sucker coming up out of that leaf axle but it's really hard to see there will eventually be this one's been broken off but there will eventually be suckers come out of each one of those leaf axles you prune indeterminate tomatoes so that you can manage them i've tried caging indeterminate tomatoes without pruning them and they are so hard to harvest they're hard to deal with they grow they keep growing and they spread out and they take up a lot of space, it's hard to get in there and work on. So, so you, you prune and trellis them so that you can manage them. And then you support indeterminate with a tomato, with a trellis rather than a cage or, or the weave system. All right, a little bit about physiology very quickly. As you watch your tomatoes grow, you will see that that first sucker right there is always going to be the strongest of those suckers coming up off from the leaf axle. So this hasn't even broke, this bud right here, the sucker has not even broke out and this one hasn't broken out. That's, that's a hormone related thing. These others will show up, but they'll, they'll be later. Uh, but the, so these two right here, and that's kind of a hormone interaction. The, the tip, terminal tip of these uh, plants produces a hormone that keeps all these these uh, suckers from breaking and after every flower cluster you'll get a stronger sucker and i don't i haven't really read the research and so i have my theory that this flower cluster actually blocks that that hormone that keeps these other buds in check so that that first bud is stronger than than the others and and by the time it gets past that flower cluster, back down, the others are being blocked again. So uh, it's kind of an interesting thing as you're watching the tomatoes grow. Okay, so poll number two, Mark, and then if we got some more questions, we'll take some more questions. Okay, give me a second. So poll number two. All right, I'm launching that now. And uh, Debbie had a question about, she says, uh, most, most of the tomatoes I grow are indeterminate. It seems like when I do not prune away the suckers, they still produce a lot of fruit. Why would I want to prune, why, why would I want to prune them? The, yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you want to deal with the mess, that's fine. It's just a management thing. The reason is you're not, you might get bigger fruit because of your pruning, but you're not going to get more fruit. Um, you can grow in a tighter space so you can actually 
square foot of your garden, you can get more fruit because you're growing it up instead of letting it sprawl all out. So, so for plant, no, you're not going to get more fruit. Square foot of garden, you probably will get more fruit, and it's just a lot easier to manage, a lot easier to handle, uh, a lot easier to scout for insects, I mean, just a lot of management kinds of things that although it's a little bit of a pain to do, it just makes it a lot easier to, to handle those uh, management issues that you have with your plants. And I, I don't know if you're going to talk about this. See, in my own personal garden, I've got, I guess, they're cherry tomatoes that come back every year, and I'm assuming those are uh, in, indeterminate. But is, is that a rule? Is there a direct correlation? The ones that will sort of come back every year from seed, are they always indeterminate, or that, that's, it, it could be either or? It could it could be either or your your cherry tomatoes are almost always indeterminate. Mm. So so I mean they do have those little patio cherry tomato plants and they're just a small tomato, but typically those cherry tomatoes that you grow that give you quite a few tom tomatoes, they are I, I have not come across a full size tomato plant with cherry tomatoes that is not indeterminate or hybrids so you're not necessarily going to get the same kind of tomato as what you originally you know that dropped on the ground and, and sprouted to grow this year so uh if you're if you're determinate type tomatoes you may get determinate or indeterminate tomatoes out of that depending on the breeding that went into the, the plant mm. so okay becky says uh do 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 suckers grow back after uh after pruning uh, yeah, sometimes they do. So you'll get a, another sucker will break out of that leaf axle later in the season. So you kind of just, as you go along, I'll go along and I'll notice them, where in the world did that come from? Because I know I pruned them earlier. So yeah, they'll, they'll pop up once in a while. Does it, does it help to wait till the suckers get a little longer to actually snap them off as opposed to when it's just a teeny little, little leaf or does that matter one way or the other? Here. And I think I think we lost you there, Ron. Okay. Okay. Oh, am I back here now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, this must be another connection issue. Um, it's it's best to do it when they're about three or four inches long. Okay. Mm -hmm. A quick answer to that question. Sure. Okay. Uh, Lisa says, is it, uh, is it better to plant in raised beds versus, uh, is it better to plant in raised beds versus directly in, in the ground or do tomatoes not care? Uh, it depends on your soil. So if, if you're planting into the soil, raised beds warm up a little earlier in the spring. And so that'd be a reason for doing that. If you have bad soil, you may want to have, uh, a, you know, grow boxes with a, a different soil in them if, if you've got soil issues. Otherwise, tomatoes don't really care. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do one more uh, question. We've got a few more, but let's just do one more, and then you can, get, you can continue with the presentation, and we'll, we'll take uh, questions at the end. Uh, so how to support a tomato plant against strong wind, especially 45 to 60 mile per hour wind? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um the cages don't work real well that way and so I, that's when one of the when the weave system would actually be better than the cages but if you need to if you've got cages uh, a, a t-post drive a t-post in the ground to tie your cage to to keep it upright is about the only uh reasonable option option that you have when you're caging the trellising and weaving they have those t-posts are part of the structure and so they will tolerate the winds better than the cages do. Yeah. I put metal stakes in mine. I've got a west facing garden and I get pretty strong wind. And I always, I learned after that first year to, I have to stake mine down and I'll just use like plastic zip ties to zip tie the cage to those stakes so that it doesn't get blown down. Okay. So for yeah. our poll question, uh, I don't, if you, if you can't see it, uh, both uh, about 70% of folks says, say they're doing both, uh, 
uh, both determinant and in, in, indeterminate. Okay, I'm getting a little more technical problems. Can you hear me now, Mark? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can hear you. Did you hear my, did, did you hear the response? I, I didn't. Uh, I was going to say that uh, to, to the answer to the poll quick question, about 70% of people were, were doing both determinant and indeterminate. Cool. All right. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll cover them both. All right. So now white prune, this kind of answers one of those questions back there. Well, you want to space concerns, especially if you've got a smaller garden space, you want to be growing tomatoes, but you don't want them to take up a lot of room. Those, uh, indeterminate the tomato vines can get in here so of course that's in a high tunnel so that might be a little bit longer than you would normally expect but but still I mean that's a long vine and and so that's the one thing disease control uh, you get a little bit better airflow you don't get the leaves dying if, especially if you're in a humid area like back east you have uh, you'll get fungal problems on the leaves as they die and rest over the top of the fruit so it helps with the disease control definitely helps when you're scouting for pests it's a lot easier to to find what you're looking for when you've done the pruning and then of course we talked about this a little bit harvest management each uh, when it's ripe and and not miss those are reasons why to prune so we'll talk about pruning, the actual pruning now uh, of the tomatoes. So what are we going to prune? Well, we'll prune the suckers, and I'll talk a little bit about pruning fruit later, and then how you prune then is going to depend on your growth type, whether you're doing determinate or indeterminate tomatoes. So it's all based on that first flower cluster. You'll be going up there, you'll have suckers coming off the plant, off that main stem, and then you'll have a flower cluster, okay? So you go and you find that first flower cluster and you go back to that first sucker. So we have the flower cluster right here. We've got that first sucker below the flower cluster. Remember I said that something about this flower cluster right here allows this first sucker, uh, every time you come to the first cluster, uh, sucker below the flower cluster, that's gonna be the strongest sucker uh, in that part of the stem. And so we come back to that first sucker, and that's the one we keep. We take all of these suckers down here below. We've got suckers all over the place. We've got sucker here and here and back over this way and over there. There's all kinds of suckers down below. We take those all off, and there you go. So this is the same plant, a little bit different picture, but same plant. We've got the first flower cluster. We've got the first sucker, and all of these suckers down below have been removed. Okay, now for determinate tomatoes, that's it. Basically, uh, you may need to clean out leaves and things like that. It's too much of a pain to try to worry about doing the ter tertiary stems. So if you take that sucker right there and do that, you've removed all these lower ones. It makes the plant a lot easier to manage, but that's really all you need to do. Okay, but for indeterminate uh, tomatoes you kind of need to make a choice whether you want to have a one or two liter plant so um, the uh, one liter plant you would just keep this main stem you wouldn't even keep this sucker right here you just keep this main stem and you would take them off that you can plant your plants closer I, I I think I'll do some research on on whether or not that actually increases yield whether it's actually worth it but but you can do it that way one one liter or two liter so one liter, you remove all these suckers, and all you do is just keep that main stem. That's all you do. And all these suckers beyond the flower cluster, you take them all off. That's all you got is one stem going up, and it's got flower clusters every third leaf, and that's what you'd harvest. That's the one liter. If you go to the two liter system, these are the two that you'd keep. You keep the main stem, you'd keep that first sucker below that first flower cluster, and then as these two grow, you take off all other suckers. So you have two stems, and you have the flowers, the flower clusters, and the fruit going on, on both of those stems as it grows up. So that's the two liter system. All right, so here's some pictures. It just goes through some pictures really quickly. Here's two plants that have not been 
pruned, sucker pruned, and so watch that one on the left. Okay, back up. There we go. Okay, and that's what it looks like up close. Again, you've got this first sector right here. You've got the flower cluster. Everything below that's been taken off. As these grow, we take off all the suckers and just keep the flowers and the leaves on those stems. All right, now let's watch the one on the right. Not pruned. There you go. It's pruned. Pretty easy. That's what <laughs> okay, I had to go actually do it. They didn't fall off. But anyway, so that's how you go. So now what you're looking at on a two-liter system We've got the main stem, we've got the first flower cluster, and the first flower cluster, well, let's go here. The main stem's that one right there, and uh, the sector, that first sector is this stem right here, and the flower cluster is right there. So this was the first flower cluster. It's, of course, been removed since the, this plant is a lot bigger, but this is what it looks like after you take off those leaves and, and see the plant. You've got the plant clips and everything helping to support that. And, so as the plant gets older, remove those old leaves. It does help you keep things cleaned up. I think I'm probably getting to where I need to hurry just a little bit more. But uh, we got uh, the determinate as far as fruit pruning. Now that was that's the pruning for the suckers. Now fruit pruning on the determinate tomatoes don't bother. Just let them produce whatever they're going to produce. They're pretty pretty well clustered. For the indeterminate tomatoes, most of the commercial growers will for their slicing tomatoes. Uh, keep about five fruit per cluster and move on because they want to have those plants, those fruit all produce at about the same time so they can harvest them quickly and move on to the next cluster of flowers. And so they'll thin those down to about five and, and it does make it a little bit easier to manage because you're not trying to check more than one cluster at a time. And they'll actually lay these vines down. They have spools to lengthen down. They'll have the vines laying down along the ground. It's uh, interesting to watch. On uh, the cherry tomatoes, uh, it kind of goes against nature to say, oh, I got all these cherry tomatoes on there, but I've found that as you get beyond about 15 to 20 cherry tomatoes, those lower, later tomatoes just don't taste quite as good, and they're kind of a pain again to get around. And so, you know, 10 to 15 cherry tomatoes, I know a lot of these commercial guys will, will limit it to that. So it's up to you whether you want to actually limit it, but uh, that's, what the, uh, that's the fruit pruning part of it. Okay, any questions? I've got more to go, but uh, if we've got any questions. Leah, we'll, we'll at least take a couple here. So Paulette says, uh, when you talk about cherry tomatoes, does that include grape tomatoes? Yes. Okay. They're a little, they're a little bit different, but as long as they're indeterminate, determined, I'm just talking about, yeah, yeah, most of these guys with grape tomatoes, they, they limit them to about 10 on the cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Kate just says, uh, do you prune bottom leaves to bring in light and air? All right, I, I lost your discussion. You can, can you I, hear I me okay hear, now? I can't hear you now. Okay, says uh, someone asked, do you prune bottom leaves to bring in light and air? The light is now the interior uh, you want to just clean them out air air movement is the big thing you're trying to keep the moisture and airflow through there so you don't get disease build up inside as far as um, light the the outer leaves are the one that are intercepting the light uh, it's not gonna get, you're not gonna get a whole lot inside the plant direct light onto the leaves so uh, you basically you, you prune out those inside leaves just to kind of keep things clean and make it easier to harvest mm -hmm. Randy says, does pollination happen by movement and wind or by insects? Um, tomatoes are pretty kind of self-pollinated. It's mostly insects and wind. Uh, you know, bumblebees are really good tomato pollinators. I mean, they sit there and they buzz on the, on the flower. And uh, a lot of people, if they don't have, you know, if they're in a greenhouse situation, they don't have bumblebees in there to help pollinate, they will get a, one of those toothbrush things and just kind of go along and touch each flower and, and I've never had any problem with pollinating in my high tunnel even so um, I don't know that uh, it's necessary to to do that but but it might yeah, it might help to to pollinate that way but, but yeah it's 
the flower really doesn't open. The pollination occurs really before the flower even opens up, and so it, they're kind of self-pollinated. Uh, Lance says, any, suge any suggestions about growing the sprawling current uh, pimp t t tomatoes? The what kind of tomatoes? Pimp. P-I-M-P. I am not familiar with okay. pimp yeah. tomatoes. Lynn if, there's, Lynn, if there's another name or if you can click clarify that, do that for us. If it's, um, if, it's a, if it's a sprawling, viney type tomatoes, then that would just indicate to me that it's an indeterminate variety, um, which then you'd print it like an indeterminate tomato. So. Uh, Gary says, we, will you be covering the Florida weave method? I'll talk about that a little bit, yes. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, we got a couple more, but let's just go ahead and let you, you move move on, so you can get into some of the tre trellising things. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about the support cage, the, that wrap or weave, and then uh, trellis. So caging basically, you've got it's for determinate tomatoes. It does not work well on indeterminate tomatoes unless you have a cage that's twenty feet high, and then of course it's hard to harvest. So not a good idea trying to cage indeterminate tomatoes. Your support is from below, and whether or not you prune is up to you, but I do like to prune out those lower suckers. Uh, they can be top heavy, and um, they're kind of hard to manage, especially when it's windy. Uh, so so I, I don't like, I like, I don't like the commercial tomato cages that have the narrow base and wide at the top kind of thing. I, I make my own tomato cages for my determinate tomatoes, and they're basically a, a hog wire fence and they're round and they're about two feet across bottom to top and so it's kind of up to you how you want to do that but they are a little bit of a pain to manage in in windy situations you can stake them down get a t-post in there or, or some other kind of a stake to tie them down keep them from blowing over in the wind uh, anyway so that's the that's the caging very quickly the weaving now this is not a very good picture this is actually isn't the floor to weave but but what you're doing is you you weave between the plant on that side and then you come on on this side and you want to have good support this this uh, wooden stake i don't think would hold tomatoes so this is not a very good picture but but again it's for determinate tomatoes so I, okay, let me finish that so you, you go through you weave on this side and then when you come back you come back and around and you'll go on the other side so this is an incomplete weave here you go on the other side so that you have you have the twine on both sides of the plant at each point. I don't think, looking at this one here, I really don't think this one would support the tomatoes really well because it's just, it allows them to, as you get the weight of the fruit on here, allows it to sag down and it just wouldn't work. I, I don't think this would work. You need to go on both sides of the plant each time when you go around it. Um, so you want to make sure you use, this is not a very good twine, I don't think it, it would stretch. You want to use something uh, nylon or poly type twine that will uh, not stretch because as you get that weight of the fruit on there, it will um, it will stretch if you can. You want to make sure you go on both sides of the plant at each time you weave, and then again pruning is up to you. But I would still prune out those lower branches, and it is easier to manage than the uh, the cages. I think you can get to the fruit a little bit better with this particular system. And then the post distance between them, I would probably – I'd have it used to, but, but six feet between the posts so that you've got good strength there on the plants to hold them up. Okay. And then trellising. Trellising is, is what we do on the indeterminate tomatoes. It is supporting them from above. So we've got the support structures up over the top of the plants. We use uh, tomato clips, and we'll show a little bit about the tomato clips. And we definitely want to be pruning if we're trellising. Uh, the post distance on these, uh, I have them every four feet. There's just a lot of weight on those, uh, those plants and on the trellis system. And so every four feet, I have a, a T post to hold them up. So here's the clips. Very quickly, they, they, they clip onto the twine, and then it clips around the stem. The stem goes up through this hole. The twine will be clamped in this little notch right there. And the stem is not then damaged um, by the, the clip. 
and about every every uh, well, you put a click about every fruit cluster. So uh, they do have larger ones. You, you'll find I have found that down at the base of the plant that gets a little bit bigger. And these clips, you need to, the bigger ones will help to maybe not pinch those off. But by that time, I can remove some of those too. Okay. So here's, uh, I'm not going to do the video itself, but this shows the trellis that I, that I uh, had designed, that I use. Uh, I've got T-post every four feet. I've got, a, this is one inch schedule 40 PVC. These are those saddle tees where the T-post, the PVC just snaps into the fitting so that you don't have to make joints every, every uh, post. And it just sits right across the top of those saddle tees and you snap those into place. You tie your PVC up to the T-post with uh, zip ties or twine, and then you run your, your PVC across the top. Four feet between gives you uh, adequate support for heavy fruiting tomatoes. Okay. And here's how you find, I have a video, that was a shot from my video. Have, here's how you find uh, those videos. There's uh, there a lot. A lot of options are a lot of easy to put together. So if you go to EDU, you select videos down on the right hand side, there will be a, a link for videos. And then when you get to that, that's the USU Extension YouTube channel, whatever they call that. If you just type in Patterson Trellis, it will be the first thing that you'd see on, on how to build that. And you just watch the video, it shows you how to build that trellis. If you want to see the video on how to prune the tomatoes, I've got one there uh, as well. And so you go to the same place and then you search for Patterson pruning tomatoes and then watch that video. I've got a bunch of more videos and I think Mark can probably put up the link to that in the chat window to, uh, to show, to get you to the playlist of all my videos. Some of them are really basic type things. Some are just kind of cool ideas that I've discovered and, and whatnot. So if you want to go watch those, that's fine too. Yeah, hey, I'm going to put the YouTube. So that's your, the link I just put in folks is uh, for his, uh, Ron's YouTube uh, channel, and then um, I would, I'll put a link for the USU Extension YouTube channel is there. So, Okay. All right, so now pest control. The big advantage to pruning as far as pest control goes is it just makes scouting a lot easier. When you're out there, you've got the plants up off of the ground, you've got the fruit up off the ground, you can see what's going on. It's just a lot easier to scout for these pests. Um, it keeps the ground, if you keep the ground clean, then you can also kind of check on the ground for frass, like, uh, you know, the tomato hornworm's a big one that I'll get even in my high tunnels. And uh, so you start checking for frass on the ground and it's a lot easier to see if you've got those plants up off the ground. Uh, you can fly the little flying white flies or whatever. I did have white flies in my high tunnel one year. That's the only year I had it because I bought the tomatoes from someplace else instead of starting my own. And so I don't do that very often. Um, and then also at the same time, you want to make sure you're looking for the beneficial arthropods, the, the, the insects, the, the ladybugs and the lacewings and the minute pirate bugs and, and lots of things that eat the aphids and the spider mites. And so you're checking for the spider mites and, and the white flies and the leaf hoppers and all that, but also make sure you're, you're scouting also for the beneficial insects as well, and then apply whatever product, you know, control method that's going to be the least harmful to the beneficial insects. And then frequency, because you're out there at least once a week attaching leaders to the trellis line, you're out there and you've got time to look through. And so, again, this gives us a, a an opportunity to be out there with the plants, looking them over, checking for problems that they might have. So uh, those are some of the pest control advantages that, that I see. And this is what we're trying to avoid. This is back, this picture, this bug was, <laughs> that was before, before I started trellising my tomatoes. That, you look by the date there, it's back in 2007. I started doing my trellising about 2009. So, uh, that yeah, that's uh, that thing will that, that thing will bite your finger off. 
<laughs> big ugly thing. That's yeah, that's sitting right on my hand. So anyway, um, then a pest, of course, you want to check for your tomato hornworm is is the big one that I get. White flies. Sometimes I've never had problems with spider mites or aphids on my tomatoes, even in my high tunnel. Once in a while, I will get curly top virus uh, in the high tunnel. I've had I get it more out out in the field a lot more, but in the high tunnel. Um, very seldom, but once in a while I get the curly top virus. Now, another thing to be aware of, as you do this pruning, you will get a physiological leaf curl on those older leaves. That's not a disease, it's really not even a problem, that's just an indication to me, okay, those leaves are about this time for me to prune those off. It's, it's not a problem, it's just a physiological response to the pruning that we do. Uh, and then verticillium wilt is, is more of a soil issue, so that's more of your watering and irrigation, which of course we're not covering in here. So those are, those are things that I check for as I'm out scouting my tomatoes and I'm, I'm uh, trellising them to make sure that I've got a good healthy uh, crop of tomatoes coming. So here's another way to have fun in your garden. You want to go from the picture on the left to the picture on the right. Any more questions? Oh yeah, we got plenty. Uh, someone <laughs> asked, "What are what are spools?" Oh, spools. Okay, yeah. so so uh, the commercial growers they have a wire instead of the the trellis like I've got here. They have a wire that goes across here, and they have this this spool of twine, and it's a light gauge twine that's spooled up on this. And as the plant gets longer, they'll lay those down and they'll unwind the the twine from that spool and lay that down so that as the, and they'll just keep clipping the, the plant up as it goes so that the flower clusters that's ripening right now are the ones that are easiest for them to reach so they're just trying to get those down what i do on mine is i just drape the tomatoes up over the top they go all back down to the ground and i start to troll them and i get uh, you know this, my trellises are six and a half feet tall and so i, I get 20 foot vines in my growing season but i haven't quite figured out how to get the, the spooling to get those to lay down instead of having to go up and down and up and down. So that's what the I, spool is. I was going to ask that, Ron. So, yeah, you like yours are, are about six feet high, but you let it grow up so it doesn't – it's longer than six feet. You just let it go over the top and then hang down the, uh, the other side. Okay. Did you lose yeah, me? I, I lost you again there, Mark. Sorry, I, I was going to say the the picture you had your trellis is, your trellis was about six feet tall. So you but but they grow longer than six feet. You let them grow up to that level and then hang down the other side. Right, right. Yeah, I grow up over, drape them down the other side, and then when they get down to the ground, I start them. I'll actually release the clips from the base of the plant and start clipping the the leading back up again. So you kind of have them draped up over and back up again along my trellis. Not the best system, but uh, it works well. Yeah. Um, okay, what, uh, Carolyn says, what is the reason that you don't prune that first sucker? Well, first of all, that first sucker behind the fl that flower cluster is going to be the strongest sucker coming up. And so if you're going to be using the two liter method, that's the sucker that you want to keep. Um, on the, uh, the determinate tomatoes, again, that's the strongest sucker below the flower cluster. You're kind of cleaning out that stuff below. That just kind of gives you a starting point. So from here on, I'm going to keep all the suckers. But with the with the indeterminate tomatoes, that's if you're doing the Y or the two liter system, that's the sucker that you want to keep. It's it's the strongest sucker that, that attaches. You got some of these down low, but you really want to get some vegetative growth on there. And so that's why you take off those and that you got two good strong leaders that way. Brian says, uh, what, what are your thoughts on mulching t tomato beds? Uh, mulch is uh, always a good idea. It kind of depends on your soil and the mulch that you use. Um, I, I have, uh, where you see these pictures, actually what I have is a weed barrier down underneath because I did not have the time to, to deal with that and I didn't have the material for mulching like it would have been uh, beneficial. And so... Yeah, mulching is, is not a bad way to go to help your soil as long as you make sure you've got good mulch product to, to, that you're using. Okay. Uh, Debbie says, a young gardening friend told me that he cuts the top of his tomato plants when they were small, maybe one to two feet, and that encouraged more branching and more fruit. I've not heard of this method 
before, have you? No. <laughs> Short answer to the question. I haven't heard of uh, it. Does it would encourage, I suppose, more branching because what it does is it takes off that uh, that plant hormone that kind of blocks the the buds from doing so. Yes, you would get more branching. Um, I I've heard of people doing that towards the end of the season to try to encourage the plants to produce fruit instead of vegetative growth at the end of the season, try to ripen that fruit up faster. And I don't know that that really helps either. I haven't. Okay. Your research to indicate in, in, in that produce more tomatoes, I would question. Okay. All right. Um, Natalie and someone else mentioned this too. They, they didn't hear the post distance for wrapping. I would I would keep it no more than six feet. Okay. I think uh, six feet would be. There are some of them you go and you look at people who are doing it and they say ten feet, but um, yeah, you could try ten feet, but I would try to keep it about six feet. I think. Okay. Jessica says, uh, "How many tomatoes? Uh, how many tomatoes do you plan between the four foot poles?" If I do the two liter system, I plant two tomatoes plants. So they're two feet apart. If I do the one liter system, I would plant them every 12 inches. Okay. And says uh, the audio cut, cut out at one point. She says, repeat the distance between stakes for the weave support. Okay. Again, that would be about six feet. Okay. Uh, back on our pimp tomatoes. So she gives us the actual name here. Solium pimp folium. I, I'm, I'm, butchering that. I don't know if you can see, Ron, can you open the Q&A? You might be able to look and see. She says the, the name is a, a mouthful. The tomato is P, P, is P size. She's trying them for the first time this year. Uh, that's a new one to me. That'd be yeah. interesting to see, but if it, if it has a, if it's an indeterminate type tomato, um, I would probably treat it the same way I do my, my uh, cherry tomatoes. And I'll prune them just like I do with the two-year system. Okay. Um, let's see. Very good presentation. We'd like to use a reference. Is the presentation available, uh, Ron? If you if you'll make the present, if you're okay with us making it available, we can add it to the uh, Learn event on learn.extension.org. Sure. You'll just keep the recording, right? Yeah, uh, I'll have the recording. I'll go ahead and, and, in fact, I'll mention that now again, that the recording will be on the learn event at learn.extension.org, and then we'll be sure to make sure the slides are available there, too. There's an event materials section at the bottom of that page, and uh, you'll see a link for the uh, the presentation there. Um, Matthew says, what is, what is the closest you can plant indeterminate tomatoes together along with determinate tomatoes? That depends on how much you want to fight. <laughs> They'll be fighting for space there. Uh, yeah. But I mean, the, the fact that they're determinate and indeterminate, does that, I mean, can you, as opposed to having all determinate or all indeterminate, is that going to make a di difference? No, no. The, the determinate, indeterminate is not going to affect, having them right next to each other is not going to affect how the other one is going to grow. That was based on the seed genetics when you planted and, and whatever you're going to have right next to it, it's not going to make any difference. This one will always be an indeterminate. This one will always be a determinate. So okay. it's just a matter of how you're going to be managing the space. All right. We've got a few more questions. We're up on our time, though. Let's take – Ron, are you okay to take a few more questions? Sure. Okay. Yeah, let, let's just take a few more minutes. Uh, Marcia says, uh, is, is, the twine, is the twine anchored to the ground as well as – the top of the trellis. I haven't found it necessary in tomatoes. You've got them at the top and you're anchoring, you're clipping it around at the base of the tomato. Tomatoes are a pretty tough stem. And so as you go up, uh, I have not found it necessary to anchor it down to the ground as well. Okay. Gary says, what, are, what is the advantage of using a high tunnel? A high tunnel, the big advantage for high tunnels is uh, it, your air warms up faster and the plants grow faster you get you get more of a growing day in a high tunnel in the springtime um, if you're in a windy situation you'll protect the plants from wind and that helps a lot so the the big 
those are some of the big advantages. I, I enjoy working in a high tunnel. When it's raining outside, I can go out and work in the high tunnel. Don't have to worry about mud getting stuck to my shoes or whatever. Uh, so those, those are the big advantages. You can extend your season by about six weeks in the spring. You might be able to expand it, extend it another couple weeks in the fall. So you can get a, maybe up to eight weeks of growing season extension. And that's the main thing. But I think your plants respond faster because your air temperature, your ambient temperature in the day gets up there quicker and photosynthesis is related to temperature. So as you get that warm temperature up quicker, you get, you get a better photosynthetic response throughout the day for a longer day. Okay. Tina says, I think you probably mentioned this, but Tina says, how far apart do you plant tomatoes when using a trellis? Again, yeah, that depends on, on whether you're doing a one liter system or two liter system. If a two liter system, I plant my tomatoes two feet apart, the, the indeterminate tomatoes, you know, two feet. If it's just a one liter system, I'll go with 12 inches or one foot apart. Mm -hmm. Okay, Denise says, you mentioned putting milk jugs next to your tomatoes. I was thinking about buying my milk jug, uh, about burying my milk jugs with some small holes in uh, some small holes to help deep water. Well, what do you think? So the question is, how fast does the water soak into the ground? I use drip irrigation, which is basically, you know, just a slow uh, water into the ground. The milk jug um, in the ground, you may be depriving the plant of some of the soil area that it needs. And so my milk jug purpose is just to, for warming and, and cooling. I don't use it to water. I've seen people do that. And if you have a ground that doesn't take the water real fast, that may be a way of getting it to slowly seep out into the ground. If you've got a sandier soil or a little more, a little lighter soil, I don't see where that would be an advantage. Okay, we've got a math question here. Matthew says, uh, which which would have a higher yield, two a two two liter at two feet apart or one liter at one foot apart? Yeah, that's my question. That's that's the research that I want to do. Uh, okay. I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, Barbara says, uh, Craig Lou Hauer, I'm probably saying that name wrong. He's a North, uh, North Carolina tomato guy and author, recommends two to three liters. If you were to go with three liters, uh, which would you choose for the third liter? I'm... Good question. I have to see how the plant goes. I really haven't uh, haven't considered three liters. Um, I guess I'd have to look and see what uh, what his recommendations would be. I I would be inclined to have that third liter be a branch further up the plant. You know how the suckers were coming out, and then you had the branches were kind of co-dominant there. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be kind of further up the plant. So I'm not sure that's what he's thinking. You may be maybe one of those lower lower before you even get to the flower cluster might be what he's doing i'm not sure okay and one more question can you can you trail us both types can you trail us both determinate and indeterminate i've tried determinate tomatoes do not trail us well mm. you just will put a cage or a weave around those uh, the problem with the trellising is that you're limiting the number of fruit and then you're also limiting the number of fruit because the vine itself doesn't get as long and so you're limiting your production a lot when you do that. I've had some tomatoes that uh, the catalog said it was indeterminate. It wasn't. And so I was printing it as it were, though it were an indeterminate tomato. And I found out, ah, now I've got a determinate tomato here. Now what do I do? And you just, you just really limit your yield. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, we got one last question, but Cammy, you want to put in a plug for, uh, have we got another webinar coming up? Nope. That's it for I'm this year. Think. So done for this year, but, but yeah. You never know. We, we, we've always got time left of the year, so uh, look look for any emails. Ron, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, it's been uh, fun. appreciate you guys helping me out here. Uh, Gary does have another quick question. There, that PVC, the top bar is actually PVC. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, K.E. Sundell says, uh, I, don't, I don't pinch my flowers back. Uh, you might, but it doesn't. I don't know that it helps a whole lot. So. Right. All righty, I think that is it, Ron. Thank you so much for for your time. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thanks, folks. See ya. Bye bye.
Bye. Bye. Thank you.